Throws it back and scores! Brady Leibold goes back and forth behind the net, comes out the right side and lifts the backhander up and in. Leibold right here on Dylan. Dylan comes back with the right of his own. Here's Leibold uppercut. Another right by Leibold. Coming out another fight, Brady Leibold got the right hand pumping on Tony Mann up and over top and trying to control him as Leibold got that jackhammer right going. Throwing a lot off the helmet. Now Cody Mann answering, but Leibold switched to left and he got a few more in there. Oh, you gotta be loving this if you're at the Civic Center. Thanks again for joining me on another episode of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. This is Brady Liebold coming at you again from Muskoka, Ontario. Guys, this is episode number nine. Number nine. Thank you so much for your continued support, guys. It's so overwhelming. I have lots of exciting news, guys. Uh, I want to take this time right now to announce that on Tuesday morning, uh, that's next Tuesday coming up um, on sportsnet.ca. Gear Joyce will be writing an article uh, about my story. I haven't read it yet, but it should be intriguing for sure. So be sure to head over to sportsnet.ca and check that out. Um, once again, though, guys, this episode is proudly brought to you by Team Issued Limited. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life Team Issue does this by recreating that special feeling of being part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. Guys, head over to www.teamissued.ca to check out the clothes, guys. They also do custom gear. Uh, it's a WHL alumni, a former Kelowna Rocket teammate of mine, Jesse Paradise's company. The clothing is absolutely dynamite. My shit should be here on the 27th of April. He sent me some stuff. I cannot wait to be repping the Team Issued, guys. Make sure to go to www.teamissued.ca and use promo code Toe drag 15. Toe What's drag How are you? 1 5 to get 15% off your total purchases. Um, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, lots has been going on. Like I said, the Sportsnet article is coming out. That's really exciting. Uh, I'm building a studio up here in Muskoka on my girlfriend's parents' property. Uh, thanks again to Matt Thompson for sending me some money for the materials. Uh, I still have a long ways to go. It's a work in progress. Um, guys, please uh, head over to my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that and subscribe on Spotify or wherever you may be listening to. I really appreciate it, guys. Uh, I'm also working on a website. Uh, there's a link for that on my page. Um, again, thank you so so, so much for all the support. Uh, without further ado, though, let's get into this episode. I have a very special guest, uh, somebody that I call a big brother, um, which I don't have, is a big brother. So, this guy is the closest thing to it. Um, this guy's a former first overall pick in the CFL draft by the Edmonton Eskimos in 2006. He's now a professional heavyweight boxer. This guy has an incredible story. Uh, he's one of my very best friends from Delta, British Columbia, Adam, the Boogeyman, Braidwood. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Right on. Well, right now I'm just, uh, since I'm one of the only non-hockey guys we're going to have on the show, I'm looking at uh, some hockey lingo here. Uh, we got chiclets. That means teeth, apparently. Uh, we got uh, the cheese, the top shelf. So I'm just going to get familiar with the lingo before we start here. Maybe I can even throw some in. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, you know, I grew up uh, like a lot of kids in Canada. You know, I just had a normal family, normal household, and uh, I excelled at sports. And, you know, you, you named off a lot of my accomplishments there. And like I tell a lot of people, I got two different resumes. And that's the good resume. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the bad stuff as well. Um but, uh, but yeah, no, I just, I grew up Delta BC, uh, played a lot of sports, ended up getting a scholarship, probably around did that and then got in a bunch of shit and, or a bunch of trouble. Are we, are we swearing on the show or no? Yeah, man. Have at it. Have at yeah, it. I got in a bunch of shit and then, uh, uh, decided to get out of it and I'd kind of messed around with fighting stuff for years, MMA, boxing, all that. Never really took it that serious. And then. I uh, got out and was uh, got out of jail and was living in a halfway house and uh, wanted to make some extra bucks and keep myself out of trouble. So I was working construction and uh, ended up fighting again and and uh, yeah, I ended up running with it and uh, was actually supposed to fight for a Canadian title two weeks ago, but obviously with uh, this uh, virus stuff going around, all the shows are canceled and. Uh, now I just live out in the woods uh, on Vancouver Island and just kind of train and do my thing. Yeah, Adam, I mean, 
your story is is so so incredible you did a you did a ted talk uh, i posted it on my facebook page my twitter page a lot it's it's extremely powerful and um for people that haven't seen it please check it out because you really go into a lot of detail about your story and, and i don't want to touch too much onto the details about the shit you went through because we me and you have both gone to jail you and i both have been elite athletes um you are more of an elite athlete than I am. I mean, you were a first overall pick in the CFL. You spent four years with the Eskimos. Um, what was your experience like in the CFL? Like, I know you're fighting now, um, but, you know, when I – and we'll get into how I met you. But, you know, the transition from being a football player to a fighter, I mean, are you still a football player at heart or are you kind of forgetting about that and are you just, like, 100% a fighter now? Um, you know, I, I kind of moved on, uh, from wanting to play. I do like, uh, I go out and I volunteer coach with, uh, Victoria Rebels sometimes when I was 18 to 22, which, uh, which is probably the only age I really like working with because, um, you know, I think at that age, you kind of like know who you are. You kind of listen and like, you know, I don't, I don't work with like a lot of kids and stuff. I don't have the patience for that, but, uh, I just re kind of remember being that age and even in high school and wanting to learn and wanting to know how to do things right. And, uh, in Canada, it's tough because, uh, you know, CFL, there's just not that many people playing. Uh, there's even less guys that go down to the States and learn how to play. And, and football, you know, probably like hockey, I would think it's like, you know, there's a certain way to do things. And there's a right way and a wrong way. And unless you've lived it, uh, there's, you know, like you just, you don't know the right way. Right. And so it's, it, it's fun for me to go do that. Would I miss playing? Do I miss the locker room? Do I miss all the guys? Uh, you know what? I'm friends with the guys uh, that I want to be friends with that I played with. It's fun. I don't really watch football, not because I'm like, have like some, thing where i'm like oh i don't like it it's just you know i don't really have time and then the other thing is too is just i played it i had fun i i did the best i could and then you know i just kind of moved on from there right and and i mean you're you're a tremendous athlete and i know this because i've seen you myself in the gym and i've been around you a little bit and um you know i thought myself to be an elite athlete and i thought i had a pretty good work ethic which i've come to realize i really had a shit work ethic uh, i've never actually seen anybody with the work ethic you had and i want to touch on that um and i think that's just a testament like you are you've actually already won a world title the wbu title and um you talk about that on your ted talk and that was shortly after you got out of jail um i want to go mm. back i want to go back uh to the time when you got arrested and sort of get into your legal issues. And, and I haven't touched on mine very much either. So this is why I want to get into this and we'll talk about yours, talk about mine, just sort of how we're dealing with this now. But uh, you went through uh, the court system before I did. And uh, so let me touch on how you and I met and, and you can jump in here if you remember. So uh, back in 2011, uh, you know, I was a mess. I was doing lots of heroin and, uh, all sorts of drugs, kind of not playing hockey. I hadn't played for about a year. Um, and I decided that it was time to get my shit together, which I've done multiple times since. But at this time, it was the very first time um, that I was like, hey, I need help. I'm going to go to treatment. So uh, I checked myself into a rehab center and uh, I was there for like three or four days. And about the third or fourth day, um, the counselors tell me I'm going to get a going to get a roommate in rehab. And I'm kind of choked because I got my own room and I don't really know. And they're like, well, it's, this guy's, you know, you guys have a lot in common. He's also an athlete. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But that's all we can tell you. So I remember when, when you, you, you were there and they're like, Hey, come meet your new roommate. And you were sitting down in the chair. I had no idea how big you were. You're like six, four, 280, probably back then six, five, 280. And yeah. you stood up and I just remember being like, holy shit. Right. And I just remember being, and I'm not really intimidated at too many guys. But like, holy shit, man, you're all tatted out. Biggest guy I've ever seen. And you're like, hey, man, nice to meet you. And uh, you and I hit it off right from there because we spent so many nights uh, just talking and me picking your brain because you're older than me. And you had gone through so much of this shit before me. Um, but, you know, do you remember a little bit about that experience? And do you really understand how much you really helped me through that time? Maybe I didn't stay clean for the duration, but you know that I left rehab and went to Texas and played hockey. And you're the only reason I went back to play hockey. I had no intention of playing. You were the one that pushed me and guided me and, and, and got me to do that. So I want to say thank you for that first off. But what do you remember from that experience? Where was your head at then compared to where it's at now? Uh, so I was still on, uh, 
you know, kind of a, a crazy journey. You know, I just got, I had a court ordered uh, treatment program. I just got out. And like for me, jail's not that fun. I'm usually in isolation the entire time. And it's usually like not a fun experience. So it was just kind of nice to like talk to somebody who was like nice and could kind of, you know, identify with the sports stuff. And, um, you know, like you, uh, right off the bat, I was like, ah, oh, you seem like a good kid. I was like, you seem like a little bit mixed up. So I saw some potential there and I was just like, you know, we'll try to make the most of this. You know, I've had some, I've had some bad cellmates and roommates and all that stuff. And I just saw it. I was like, you know, like maybe we get something out of this. And like, I, I don't really think about how much I influence people. I mean, uh, I, I hear that a little bit. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I just want to see people do well, especially if you come through my life. I want the best for people. And like, you know, I had a chance to meet. Uh, you know, some of your family members and stuff and just figured you were like a little bit lost on the journey. And I was like, you know, I, I just told you like my experience. I was like, this is what will happen if you keep going this way. And I go, it's pretty much guaranteed. I go, you got three options when you're on drugs, right? It's either get clean, die or, or go to jail. And so, you know, like I know that from experience. And so I was just, you know, I just saw some potential and just thought you could, uh, you know, do something with your life, right? Well, I know, and I appreciate that, Adam. And and so you and I were together for about, I don't know, 35, 40 days there. And uh, I mean, we had, we actually had a lot of fun. We played pranks on each other and, and, uh, and other people Mm. in the place. And, and, uh, you know, but you were also working out back then. And I remember you, uh, you ran me through a few boxing uh, sessions in the basement of this rehab center. Um, I mean, I was shit, but you were even back then you, I mean, you had experience with boxing. But at that time, I think you only had one or one or two pro fights. And I think one of them was an MMA fight, if I'm not mistaken. So that was in 2011. Yeah, I think back then, right? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, man. Uh, I think back then, yeah, I had like probably like four or five fights. Like, and it was just like mostly like unsanctioned amateur uh, fights and uh, one MMA fight and a couple pro boxing fights and so like I didn't really understand the sport or what it took like I it's funny because I, I always thought I trained like really hard until I met my current coach and uh, he also he, it took him a little while to figure me out and uh, he's had a good work ethic because when you go from the uh, from Canada down to the States, it's a different world. And I was lucky I had a trainer in high school because I just like I, I don't know what it is I just knew what I wanted to do and uh, we'd always like work hard and we were always trying to outdo each other and we were competitive and uh you know boxing is a different level so back then i thought i knew what i was doing until I really into the, the it, right and and started like training for real and uh my coach is funny because he, he saw potential in me uh and uh he was like you know when i first met you i, I and he goes anybody who walked in the gym is going to think that you're training hard and when i was in victoria doing construction and training uh, at an mma gym i thought i was training hard until i started fighting for real so i won that world title i did all that stuff when i was living in the the, the halfway house homeless shelter there and uh i thought i was like well on my way to be in the real deal and uh you know, uh, when you meet a guy who's been there, like my coach has cornered 49 world title fights. He's taken three local guys and won Canadian titles. And so when I met him, he was like, your comfort zone is, is very high. He goes, it's higher than most people's. Like, if anybody saw you train, they'd oh, that guy's crazy. He trained hard. But he pulled, actually pulled more out of me. So my comfort zone is really like a horrible, we just call it hell. <laughs> it's like you know we train until we drop right and it's and it's not for everybody but for me it's it's like i just do what's necessary right and so i i don't have 15 20 years of boxing experience most of the guys i fight have you know up to 100 amateur fights i've been doing it since they were 12 and so you know uh, i'm not a slow cook project i'm a microwave project so i have to just have to do more than everybody and uh you know i i see time in prison as just lost time so you know the the whatever the six or seven years that I spent in the system, I see that as six or seven years wasted. And, uh, and you know, you can look at it in any positive light you can, but, uh, you know, you just, you miss everything and you know that. And it's like, I just see lost time. So I just try to outwork everybody. Yeah. And I mean, you're doing it. Uh, your professional record is really nothing short of an outstanding uh, 14 wins two losses, 13 by the way of knockout. And I mean, the one loss I think you suffered was a long, long time ago 
um, in one of your first fights, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And then the second loss you suffered was um, two summers ago when you fought Simone Keen, who is, um, with my understanding of it is he's Canada's number one heavyweight. He's been boxing since he's been in diapers. Uh, he fought for the Canadian yeah. at the Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is what this guy does. He's from Quebec. Uh, I loved it. If, if anybody has not seen the the press conferences you guys had, man, you were so funny and so good. You put on, you're an entertainer too. Uh, and you're tough and you put on a fight and you stand in there and you fight and you want to fight. And I think um, boxing, especially in Canada, they need a guy like you. Um, Cause I'll tell you what, I had no interest really in boxing. I had lost interest. Um, and I, it's not just because I know you that, it's because just your personality and, and I think people people have really taken a notice to that. It's not just me. I'm sure promoters have been all over you. Um, whoever else is involved in the sport. I know very little about it, Adam. I'm sorry. Um, I want to know more, but uh, you know, like the amount of training you're doing and the guys that you're fighting, it, it's pretty insane. Like you said, these guys have been doing it their whole lives. It'd be like Simone Keen coming and playing football with you after training for a few years, you'd fucking kill them. And you all, and you did yeah. all right against this guy. Are you going to fight him again? Uh, or are you moving on to better things or what's going yeah, on? That's that? the, no, no, I want to fight him again. That's the plan. And so, uh, you know, I, boxing is such a complicated sport and it's, and it's just time put in. And so with that fight, I learned a lot and, uh, you know, like I'm not afraid of anybody. I don't care. And I, I do shit my own way and it ends up coming to bite you in the ass a little bit. And that fight I think was a little bit soon, uh, for me, uh, just skill wise and, uh, experience wise, because I learned a lot in that fight. Uh, which is fine. And, uh, you know, my other loss, I learned a lot in that fight. And I, I actually ended up avenging that loss and knocking out Lee. And that's kind of what I plan on doing with, uh, with Simone. He's, uh, he's to, to me, he's beatable. And like the problem with that fight is I didn't take it as seriously as I should. You know, I kind of focused on uh, the theatrics and the entertainment part of it. And, and boxing is like a progression. You have to fight a certain guys like i think a lot of people don't understand they'll they'll see a fighter come in out of the amateurs and he'll get 10 easy fights well that's part of the business because you have to build a fighter get the experience and there's only a very very limited number of guys that can jump from amateurs to pro because you go from three rounds to four to six to eight to ten to twelve well i was like out of jail Four rounder, four rounder, four rounder, twelve world title. You know, go back to four, four, four. I don't have a promoter backing me at the moment um, who's paying for big fights. Like a lot, a lot of these guys, like Simone, and uh, when I fought Martel, like these guys are backed by large promoters. They've been through an amateur system. They've been built up properly. They've been taking the right fights at the right time, right experience. Like when you look at my record of guys that I fought. Because it's expensive to get these, you know, world class opponents, and Eye of the Tiger has a huge, huge uh, bankroll, and they can bring in the right guys. You got to fight, you know, the old washed up veteran that's going to give you some experience rounds. You got to fight the young, hungry guy who's maybe not a huge puncher to get some experience rounds in with the tougher guy, but you're not risking getting hurt. Because like the thing is with boxing is it's like you're playing for keeps. Like I always compare it to being a gunslinger, right? Like you you take a shot. And you don't recover from that. It doesn't matter how long you sit out. Like once that membrane in your brain has been like damaged and you start taking shots, you see, you see this all the time. Guys lose their chin. Like, you know, Chuck Liddell and MMA, you know, you get tapped and all of a sudden you're out. Like you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not playing boxing. They always say, right. It's you play for keeps. So you start taking too much damage, take the right fights at the wrong time. Like you're going to get hurt for the rest of your life. And then your career is over. And, uh, you know, you see guys like David Widom and, uh, you know, guys that have passed away that, uh, you know, they, they took the wrong fights at the wrong time. They had this tough guy mentality. And so with the Simon fight, I learned a lot and I want a couple more fights and then him and I will rematch. You can count on that. Well, I can't wait for that. Uh, wherever it is, I'm going to make sure I'm there. I'm in a good headspace now. I will for sure be there I, when that takes place. I don't care where it is, as long as it's not in the States, because I can't go to the States right now. Um, <laughs> well, neither can I, buddy. It's <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, but no, you, you touched on, you know, playing for keeps. And obviously, boxing is, yeah, you, you, 
it's true, right? You're, you're putting your, your brain on the line. The, um, it's fitting that you brought that up because concussions is something that I've talked about a lot on this podcast. Yes, it's new, but I had a, a friend of mine that played uh, on the Kelowna Rockets with me, James McEwen. Uh, he's actually the face of the class action lawsuit against the Western Hockey League for concussions. It's a very, um, you know, there's two sides to it. Some people agree with it. Some people don't. I've had people on that are for it. Some people are against it. I'm kind of in the middle, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, he was a fighter in hockey. And again, you choose and there's another side to hockey because you're still playing a sport. Um, but yes, there's fighting. Right. In it. But now you're the guy you're actually going and that's how you make a living. Um, we talked about um, the anxiety and the fear that we used to feel as fighters in hockey sometimes because you don't know as ho in hockey when you're going to fight somebody, whereas you might know, I can't imagine what that must know. Like you're going to have to fight somebody and it's just the fight, nothing else. And you know, you're going in there because we talk about the anxiety and fear just from fighting in hockey. And, and you'd be surprised how many guys um, have that. And obviously as a boxer, you don't, you're not thinking that because you can't uh, as a boxer. So it's a different mentality. But do you ever, are you ever afraid um, of getting hit in there and, and, and something happening? And, and for people that don't know, Adam, and, and I hate to bring this up, um, but you lost a friend of yours uh, in a tragic accident, Tim Haig. Uh, you guys had a boxing match um, and, you, and you guys fought. He's a friend of yours um, and you beat him. He walked, you beat him with a knockout. He actually walked off the, can, the canvas, if I believed, but he passed away the following day or the next day. Um, due to, you know, uh, complications with the brain. Um, it's, there's so much more research in it. And, and, you know, it's so tragic. And Adam, I hate to bring that up because I know that really, um, that really was hard for you. Uh, you don't need to talk about that. You don't need to address it. But um, how is it going forward for you when you step back into the ring, um, you know, after seeing that and knowing that that can happen to you? Well, you know, I uh, I don't mind talking about it. It's important, and uh, I think it's it's one of those things that'll resonate with people because it's serious. It's final, right? And so, you know, a lot of people they see the newspaper articles about some of these hockey players and and football guys who are going in and and testifying and talking to you know uh, whatever hearings there are. They're saying they're having all these symptoms, but it's like when it's a finality thing, when somebody actually passes away, uh, you know, you can talk about it. You can learn from it my coach always says you can learn something from, from everything and so i think it, it's important to talk about it and uh you know i i think with the new studies that are coming out uh, you know i i've seen a lot of kind of different kind of conflicting views on it and uh it's a tough thing to address because the brain is so complicated and uh you know there's so many different factors so it's hard to say what affects one guy to another and i think um you know the lesson that i can kind of learn from that i would say is you got to take care of yourself right like hockey uh football boxing it's all there's always a consequence to, to to action right so you go out there and i've been getting hit in the head since i was a little kid so i don't drink uh i don't do drugs anymore like you know i use cannabis products but i i find that that helps my brain actually and yeah. uh you know i think uh um you know like doing painkillers and getting drunk and playing hungover, like all that stuff contributes to, to the brain damage uh, that you can suffer in these sports. And I think you can mitigate a lot of those issues by taking care of yourself. And I think a lot of it has to do with genetics because I've seen guys, they get hit and it looks like, you know, they're going to, you know, fall over from like almost nothing. And I can remember getting smoked in football and like, I've only had two concussions playing football. And, uh, and even in fighting, I think I've had one and one of them, I, I got hit behind the ear and, uh, in the Simone fight and I lost my balance, but I didn't even have a concussion. I was fine the next day. I was fine after the fight. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with genetics. And I think it's something we got to look more into because people need to be educated on it. I'm not huge on like policies and people telling me what to do. And, uh, you know, like if anybody wants to ask me, like, do we need to change boxing? Do we need, no, we don't. We need to educate people on uh, the risk and then people can make their own decisions based on that. And so I think, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of this talking about it is really good. I think a lot of this stupid old school mentality, like, oh, just, you know, throw dirt on it and walk off isn't the best way. But I also don't believe in this, like, 
these new sort of like just really soft protocols of like, oh, I don't feel good, so I'm not going to go out there because you know what, life's tough, man. Like life's a freaking concussion, and it, can, huh. and it don't stop; it keeps hitting you. You know what I mean? And it's like you gotta you gotta find a balance, and I think that comes through education, like anything. And uh, you know, I just I want to see people make the right decisions and not go too far one way or the other. Yeah, for sure. So you, you said, you mentioned it and it's so true. Like, uh, the last guest I had on was a really good friend of mine, Mike Hangen. And I asked him his, uh, you know, his stance on the whole concussion thing with the lawsuit in hockey, cause he's a hockey player, now a hockey coach. And, uh, he brought up some of the same points as you. He said, you know, I don't, uh, I don't feel bad for these guys that, you know, got a concussion. And then, you know, the next day went to the team party and got hammered or whatever the next day because they weren't taking care of themselves you know what i mean so you're right in that sense um uh, you know but i was i've been sitting here thinking and and you know with cte and and the brain injuries and all these things they always you always hear about football players and this and, and boxers and now i'm sitting here going you were a football player for fuck what 20 years and then you went into boxing yeah. so you went from the most high impact yeah. sport team sport to let's get my fucking head punched in um and lucky for you, you're a big, strong guy and you got good, you have good genetics, uh, like you said, but not everyone's that fortunate. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I really want to watch you fight and, you know, I, I can't wait to be ringside for one of your fights or just somewhere and even just somewhere in the, in the arena, man, because it's going to be electrifying. And I, I know you were supposed to fight here a couple months ago. I actually didn't know that until I was looking at it today. Um, and it was for a Canadian title, you said? Yeah, we're going to fight for the Canadian title uh, in Edmonton, which is going to build up to the Simone fight. But, you know, like I said, life's concussion, man. It throws weird things your way. And so, you know, I just look at it as an opportunity to get better, work on my skills. I built a gym in my backyard so I can work out. And, uh, you know, it's uh, – it, 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 it sucks for sure. I definitely wanted that fight. It's a fight I've wanted for a while. And like, I think when you get a Canadian title, I think you go down in history and uh, I think it's pretty cool. So hopefully I get the opportunity again. Uh, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that's out of my hands. I think they're going to start live streaming fights and we're all just going to fight each other, which actually works out good for me because you know, I, there's some guys in Canada that I want to fight. There's two or three guys and, and, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll see when all that gets started and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get the live stream stuff going and, uh, kind of continue on going forward. And yeah, like you said, with the, the whole like genetics thing and football and all that stuff and, and partying, it's, you know, I think that just comes with uh, the education and, and, uh, anytime there's a lot of money involved, there's always a lot of bullshit. And so you got to kind of sift through that. And just as people, we're all flawed. And so we're just trying to do the best we can and hopefully and hope not too many people take advantage of this and use it as a means to, you know, uh, get something for nothing. Cause you know, in all these sports, all of us guys who are real, you leave something out there and you don't get it back. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's sad when guys who didn't leave anything out there are trying to, you know, cash in on that. So, you know, hopefully these guys, uh, and the policies and stuff change to protect the real guys and to kind of help them. Cause I, you know, I know guys who are like, oh, I got CT, I got this, I got that. And I'm like, dude, man, you, you are hungover every time you played, you know, like that's the real issue and you're still drinking now, you know, and so like that's the real issue. And so I think, you know, like I said, it comes from education and, uh, and really understanding what's going on and every individual case is different. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so you, you said that, you know, obviously the drinking and the drugs, you, you don't, you never really drank and, and you stopped doing drugs. Um, you know, the drugs that I did were different from the drugs that you did. I mean, drugs are drugs. It's all substances. But, you know, I my drug addiction took me to a whole nother level, to the street level. I was homeless. It was really bad. Like, it got ugly. It's That's a story for another day. But at the end of the day, you started with pills, uh, painkillers. How did that start? Who gave it to you? Why? What injury? Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'd never been injured. Like I'd never even missed a practice in almost 20 years of football. Um, and it was not something that I was like super familiar with. And, uh, I, uh, I had put a lot of my anger and a lot of, a lot, I put all of myself into sports and like, that was who I was. That was my identity. And, and even at that, I was super insecure and, uh, you know, I just didn't really, 
uh, find myself outside of sports. And then I uh, tore my ACL and my knee. And, uh, you know, me being a, uh, a tough guy, I, uh, I was like, oh, this isn't going to do anything. I don't care. Like, I'll just get the surgery and I'll be fine. And uh, that's not the case. And anybody who's done it, uh, you know, it's not it's not fun. I elected for uh, to get a graft, which is they take some de- dead guy's Achilles tendon and put it in your knee. And uh, it actually takes longer to heal. And so, of course, I ignored that, just got a knee brace. And the knee brace was kind of faulty. I, I, I just wanted, like, the most basic, smallest one. And, and uh, you know, so I take responsibility for that. And uh, I uh, went out there and I blew it out again. And, um, you know, like, I don't get into the blame game. Like, I don't really care. Like, they, people's got to, you know, but I was told my knee was okay. They did another surgery. And they cleaned it out, and my ACL was torn in half, and they just kind of, like, cleaned it up a little bit. And, like, I don't really know. I didn't really look into all the, the BS behind that. And then uh, I uh, uh, ended up trying to play the whole year, and I ended up kind of, like, rehabbing it myself, running up and down the sideline. They put me on the nine-game injured list. And, uh, you know, by week nine, I was out there practicing again with no ACL, uh, torn meniscus, bone bruise. Uh, torn MCL, and uh, I was just going out there and trying to play football. I put on 30 pounds, was told uh, that uh, I was going to switch positions to de-tackle, and, uh, you know, my knee was screwed. I couldn't even do a single leg leg press with no weight on it, and my knee was shaking. I was trying to go out there and practice, so I was just eating painkillers, and like I said, like, I don't blame anybody. Like, yeah, I would go in and, like, manipulate the doctors and tell them this and tell them that, and I'd go doctor shopping, and I had guys on the team that were doing that for me, and so, like like I said, like, I take responsibility for that. I had taken painkillers on and off before. It never became a problem because I wasn't injured, and, like, I wasn't the kind of person who was really a big drinker or doing drugs before this injury. Now, what happened was, is then I went and did two fights. I went through some personal stuff and uh, I wasn't in the right mindset. And that was actually when I lost my second pro boxing fight. I stabbed my knee, gave out. I wasn't ready for the fight. I was totally distracted. I was taking painkillers and stuff. And I was going through like, um, you know, some personal stuff and uh, ended up get losing. And then I was like, okay, well, there goes my football career. There goes my boxing career. Because I was just going to quit football and just box because I was, like, so pissed off about what happened and my knee didn't feel right. So I flew out. I paid, like, five grand to see this doctor in Toronto, and he was supposed to do stem cells, which was kind of illegal back then. And, like, all this all this stuff was going on because I was an extremist. Like, I would drain my bank accounts. I just bought a house. I think I was, like, 22 or 23. I just bought a condo for way more than it was worth bought a brand new truck and then my knee gets blown out and i see this doctor i dump the rest of my savings and i open up a line of credit max on my credit card trying to fix my knee seeing every specialist this and that i go and see this doctor he feels my knee he goes your knee's torn i was like why he's like you don't have an acl and he was like we'll get you an mri he's like uh, and he and uh so i send over my old mri he goes oh it was torn last year why didn't they fix it last year i go buddy i played he was like what huh. and he's like you played and i was like yeah i played and he was like I don't know how you're walking. And so anyway, so they ended up doing another surgery down in Banff. The guy was really good. They did a, a double bundle, which is an ACL and an Achilles tendon. So it heals up twice as strong. Your own tissue heals faster. And uh, and so anyways, I was I went and told the team, I was like, hey, man, like my knee's torn again. I'm getting surgery. Like, I'm going to sit out this year. So they cut down my pay and uh they which is you know what the professional sports teams do right they got to turn a profit they're corporate they don't give a shit about you and uh so anyways uh they just told me they're like just go home rest recovered you know we'll see if you can come back and uh, i was basically i was in edmonton uh by myself i had my dog i just gone through a separation uh with my then fiance um i was just stuck in a condo and i had nothing to do and nobody to talk to about it and like i wasn't going to tell anybody that i was like struggling and like all these old demons started creeping in that i'd usually like lost myself in sports and you know one thing led to another i was trying to pay my mortgage so i started selling some pills and i started selling some other stuff and doing this and that and like my ego's gone so i start like getting involved with stuff I shouldn't have and start like, you know, like hurting people outside of sports, which is never a good thing. And, uh, you know, it was just a slippery slope. So, you know, then I realized I was addicted to these pills. I couldn't stop taking them. I get anxiety. And like, I never even heard about this shit. I was like, 
uh, I don't understand that. So I just got in my truck one day and then just drove back to Vancouver and rented a basement suite in some like crack shack. And like, it was like mold everywhere. It was garbage. I had no money. I think I had like 20 bucks in my pocket. Uh, cause I'd spent so much on pills and I was like, well, I'm just going to figure this out. Uh, and, uh, I had a, a cot on a floor. It wasn't even a cot. It was just like a mattress from a cot. No internet, no computer, no TV. Uh, I had a cell phone. I had 20 bucks in my pocket and I had a $70,000 truck parked that I couldn't afford to put diesel in. And uh, I was like, okay. And then I started going through withdrawals and then I started, then I caught the flu because I got asthma and like bacteria builds up in your lungs when you're not sleeping properly. And I got down to about 225 pounds, I think. I just sat in this basement for two weeks. Oh, yeah, I'm going through withdrawals, probably doing about 100 perks every four or five days and all this, and all this crap. And and uh, I just kind of came out of it. And I just I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let this be me. So, like, I had enough energy to, like, after about two weeks and after I got over a pneumonia, I would just, like, drive to the gym. I would walk on the treadmill for, like, 10 minutes. And then I would just, like, go back and lay in bed and be wide awake. And then I would do it again. The next day, I'd try to go 15 minutes. And I would just, like, literally, like, write it in the drywall. I'd be, like, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 push-ups, 20 push-ups. And I just did that for, like, six, eight months. And then by the end of that six months, I was actually back to myself. I was, you know, 6'4", 6'5", 200. 75 280 pounds and ended up playing the 2010 season and uh but by then i'd kind of like got neck deep and other shit and then i started taking painkillers again to deal with the knee and then i started selling it and started linking up with some other guys and then and at the end of the 2010 season we lost in the second round of playoffs but the great cup was in edmonton and then i went and kidnapped a guy threw him in the trunk of my car and uh got caught and got a bunch of shit and then uh uh two weeks later i uh, i was fucking going crazy playing russian roulette and caught uh, my girlfriend called the cops got arrested drug trafficking now gun charges thrown in the hole in edmonton reman and if anybody's ever been to the old reman a lot of fun place to be i think i had three guys in my cell in a four by seven cell for a couple of months in isolation 15 minutes out in the morning 15 minutes out at night and uh you know drained through my bank account had a mortgage and i was sitting in there they came in uh, the the whatever marshal or whatever come or bailiff comes and takes your house takes your car uh so i'm sitting in the hole like okay there goes my house there goes my car a friend of mine took my dog luckily um you know i lost my girlfriend lost my career lost my reputation i'm addicted to drugs i was i basically manipulated the doctors to give me drugs inside the jail because uh, i did have prescriptions it was legit and i don't think anybody really understood what the stuff was back then because you know doctors are good they know a little bit about a lot but they don't have that specialized knowledge in addiction and uh you know back in 2010 like this sort of epidemic was just kind of kicking off and so yeah i did i got prescriptions for drugs in there and uh you know so i was okay but then i left and uh basically looked like a crazy person i was uh almost the time that you met me i got bail got put on house arrest at my brother's house and then uh yeah i just kept doing drugs kept trying to figure out a way to make a living i couldn't uh hold down a job because i was just fucking nuts and uh couldn't really you know function so i ended up getting another gun doing the same shit ended up blasting up my own house and shooting at people fucking ruining the terry fox run thinking people are coming to get me and uh, get arrested again for trafficking um you know weapons charges discharging a firearm in a public place all this crap and uh you know, uh, uh, they put me in the hole again for another three months. So I went through another detox for about a thousand dollars a day in oxys. I was snorting and fent and all that shit. And uh, they threw me in the hole again. So I did a withdrawal on the floor in the hole in North Fraser. No TV, no blanket, no pillow, uh, thin little mattress, just looking up at the ceiling for about three weeks until I, you know, was like fucking puking and everything every day going through the chills wide awake for three weeks i think when they came and got me out of there i was talking to the wall and uh they threw me in a cell with another guy with by the name uh the face of evil uh that was his name on the front page of the paper i think and uh uh i ended up getting lucky because 
Uh, my lawyer had known me since I was a kid, so he realized that it was the drugs and I just needed help. And they went for bail if I agreed to do treatment. And that's when you met me. And so I had been through a friggin' life blender. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to try to turn my life around here. And, uh, you know, I ended up doing pretty good for a while. I ended up getting in a car accident and uh, uh, ended up using that as my excuse to start using drugs again. And uh, I did. And then, so then I got sentenced to six years, five years, 10 months, eight days, and uh, was on Suboxone and all that stuff. And then I got caught selling that shit. So they just cut me off cold turkey. So I, uh, back in 2013, I think that was, I just went cold turkey in the pan and I was like, you know what? I, I was listening, I was sitting in there, like kind of sweating, going through withdrawal and I was listening to everybody talk. And I was like, you know what? I go, everybody in here is blaming somebody else for being in here. I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. I was like, fuck that. I'm just not going to do drugs anymore. I'm going to make a choice. It's a choice to not do it. And I haven't. I haven't done any hard drugs since then. Like I said, I use some cannabis products, some CBD in moderation, and uh, I like it. And I can stop it anytime. I'm not using it right now. I'm decided to take uh, a few months off from it because I've mastered that mental side of things. I can have a glass of wine if I would feel like it, uh, which I do maybe like once or twice a year. And then I stop and I just kind of master all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, I just don't need drugs anymore, man. I just deal with my issues on my own. Well, I know, Adam, when I met you in 2011, you were kind of already in that mindset. And, I mean, yeah, you said it was 2013. So, I think, I mean, two years, 2011 to 2013. Sure, I think in 2011, you, you were already, I knew, like, you know, you were sitting down talking to me and you were making, painting a picture for me that was so clear to me clearer than anybody had ever painted but i mean it was still hard i mean you look that was 2011 we're now in 2020 and i am sort of just now finally i feel like i finally just am i feel like i'm done with drugs too so i look at you 2011 to 2013 it took you about two years there or whatever it's really not that long of a time in addiction sta point standpoint because most people deal with addiction their whole life and most people don't beat a lot of people I know have died from it. Um, athletes, non-athletes, everybody, it doesn't matter who you are. Once you start, start, it's extremely hard to stop, especially when you get into the opiates, like the oxys and the heroin and all that stuff. Um, you know, so when we were in rehab together, you actually gave me a cell phone when you left. So me and you could talk. I don't know if you remember that. Um, but then, you know, I went to Texas and they did an article about my comeback and they inter they called you and they interviewed you and that's a part of it. And, um, you know, so you maybe don't realize it because you and I haven't talked too much in the past few years, uh, not nearly as much as I would like, that's for sure. But that's mostly because I've been so fucked up. Um, I know you've been doing your thing and doing well, uh, and I've been really proud of you. And, you know, you went through the ringer before I did. Um Actually, I'm going to tell a quick story. So you went to jail before me. Um, I remember being in rehab and you telling me stories about what jail was like. And at that time, I never in a million years thought I would ever be behind bars. Um, you mentioned North Fraser. Now, the jail is actually in my hometown, um, about five minutes from where I grew up. And, you know, driving past it as a kid, I used to be scared of it. So, you know, and I was in there for a while, too, after you. So, I mean, it's just crazy. I kind of knew what to expect because you told me a little bit about it. Um, but then after I got sentenced, um, by this time you had done your time. I think you were on parole, um, in Victoria, starting your boxing thing. Uh, this would have been 2016, 2017. Um, I was in jail in BC and I got a letter and I got a letter from you <laughs> and I hadn't Ooh. talked to you in, I don't know, probably a year and a half, two years. I think the last time we talked was when a phone call that I, you'd called me from jail. Um, in about 2013, 14. So when I got this letter from you in jail, um, you know, honestly, I cried. I'm not going to lie. Um, because, you know, when, when I got, I'm going to tell you right now, when I got that letter, um, you know, there was a front page just like you, front page article. Yours was actually the very front page. And I hate to say it, but it said hero to monster. I was so fucking mad when they did that to you because I knew the other side of you um, and whatever. But, and people see that side of you now because you're doing amazing things. Um, and obviously that's old news, but you know, uh, mine was you, mine wasn't the front page, but you flip it over and it was right there, double page, whatever. So that's how you saw the article X hockey pro sentence to jail, whatever. Um, you actually had to get permission from your parole officer to write me that letter because when you're on parole, you're not allowed to 
you know, have any contact with any known criminals or whatever. Here we are, two star athletes uh, with longer criminal records than we care to admit. Um, but with mm. stor- but with stories, you know, um, and we're good people. Um, you're, you're ahead of me and you have no idea how much you inspire me. Yes. You're not a hockey player, but what you're doing, Adam, man, um, it's not just me. I know, but for just, man, you're like, a. I don't have a big brother. So you are my big brother. Um, when you wrote me that letter, man, like you gave me the rundown. Um, these people in here, if you think you're going to meet somebody in jail that you're going to make money with, that you're going to be friends with, that you're going to do this, all these things, it's not going to fucking happen. Um, you know, all these people, they're not good for you. They're not uh, whatever. I wish I had the letter here. It's at my mom's house. I'll have to get her to send it to me because, um, you know, in that moment I started to realize, cause I thought it was pretty fucking cool in jail, you know? Um, you know, being the server on the range or whatever, for people that don't know, um, you know, you get a little bit more responsibilities, whatever. It's like being the cool guy in jail. Well, I kind of realized at that moment, you're like, you said to me in that letter, Brady, you're in jail. You're not fucking cool. You're a loser (laughs) or something like that. You know what I mean? And I was like, "Fuck, fuck man, this guy's right. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's resonated with me ever since. And I've been waiting to have this conversation with you because, um, you know, I'm so proud of you and I just want to be able to be able to, uh, have my shit together to be actually, to be actually be your friend. You know what I mean? Um, because it, yeah. I'm going to share another story. So uh, you probably remember this fuck after I got home from Texas, after that comeback, I, in, I pretty much instantaneously relapsed. Well, A few months later, I decided to check myself back into the same rehab center that me and you went to. Well, I was not in a good headspace then. Um, You know, I was using while I was there because there was a place across the street that you could go buy drugs from. Well, I had no money because I'm in rehab and I'm pretty much homeless and broke. Well, I remember I went over to this house across the street because I was all sick. And I think I left them my passport and a pair of Rockin' Republic jeans or something. And uh, I think I owed them like a bunch of money or something and they're threatening me. And I remember I fucking called you or my dad called you and you had to come fucking rescue me and take me to this place, pay my drug debt. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, man. So it's just those little stories, you know, you've been there for me. I haven't had a whole lot of like brothers, a whole lot of friends, even though we don't talk um, every day. I, I hope that changes going forward. I hope that our relationship just grows because, you know, I, I really look up to you, man. Um, you have no idea. Uh, yes, you're a football player. You're the only really guy that I, I think that I know that I don't want to fight because when we were in rehab together, we fucking wrestled around. You twisted me up like a fucking press pretzel in like three seconds. And I thought I was pretty fucking tough until then. So, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just, I can't say enough about you, Adam, man. Like if anybody listening wants to know more about his story, I'm going to fucking put his Ted talk up again. Uh, it is so powerful, man. Is that your mom sitting in the front row? Uh, no, no, I, uh, I just went in there. Yeah. I went in there and did it solo. (laughs) It looked like, honestly, it looked like, cause I, I met your mom a few times. It looks like to me, it looked like your mom was sitting in the front row because I could see you getting choked up a little bit. And I thought that would be why, but obviously that would, that must've been a, a really hard thing to get through and share your story. But your story is so fucking powerful, man. Um, you know, you're a big, loud voice, a big presence, a big personality. You have so much to offer, man. And and I'm so excited to see where you're going with your fight career. Um, you know, I, I'm definitely, you know, you have my support, uh, man, you've always had my support, but now, you know, I'm kind of with it now. Um, you know, I hope that me and you can just, you know, continue to stay, you know, stay on the right path together now, you know, you've been doing well and, um, you know, just continue to hold myself accountable and, and, uh, you know, hopefully that I don't have any like months where I'm not calling you cause I'm too ashamed or too embarrassed to call you. You know what I mean? And, um, anyways, Adam, yeah, man, is there anything else that you want to say? Uh, anything that you maybe just want to, you know, anybody that's listening, what would you say is, you know, your biggest piece of advice if they're struggling right now with maybe mental health or addiction? Well, I just bought a pen pack for my friend. He's almost 40 now. This is about his third trip into to jail and he comes from a good family and um, he, uh, he made a choice to use drugs. And I told him this and uh, he didn't listen. I actually called him right before he got arrested. Um, 
because I knew what he was up to. And I just said, hey, man, you're going to get time. Like, you're going to do years. I go, you can make a choice. I go, I just got out. I got a breach of my parole. And our guys were getting 15, 16 years for all this stuff. And mm-hmm. I said, you're in a position right now where you can make a choice to uh, to not go to jail. I go, it's, it's today. You can pack up your stuff and you can go home. I said, I'll pay for it, whatever you want. And, uh, I, I, and he started getting into this like long list of why he used. And I said, you know what, buddy? I said, if anybody's got a reason to use drugs, it would be you. He's had a tough life. Like he's been through abuse after like, like all this horrible stuff. And it's a terrible story. And I said, if anybody's got a reason to use drugs, you do. But I go, it doesn't matter how good your excuse is, it's still an excuse. And so no matter how you paint it, no matter what happened to you, you can always make a choice to not use it as an excuse to use. No matter how good your excuse is, it's still an excuse. And so I would just say, look, man, people understand why you're going to use it, but don't live in that world. Like, just don't use it as an excuse. Make make your life better instead of living in that world. And so, you know, for anybody who's listening, it, everything's a choice, man. Like, nobody's coming and grabbing your arm and sticking a needle in it or stubbing stuff up your nose or open up your mouth and shoving pills down it. Like, oh, that's why I just, I can get in all this stuff and point fingers and all this and, like, say this person did this, I've been through this, and this person. But all it was was just opportunities to be shitty. Like I got lots of opportunities to be shitty and I took them and I took them. And so I blame myself and, and that's the, I'm accountable to myself and I'll always be accountable. And and that's the only way to move forward because as soon as you start blaming other people, like nobody's going to come to your rescue and be like, you know what? It is my fault here. Let me, let me give you a million dollars so you can live your dream. It's like, no man, you gotta like make that yourself. And that's it. That's my advice. Yeah, absolutely. And don't you think like that earning it on your own is, is so much better? Like, you know what I mean? Like you're living in a, in a trailer. I've, I've heard that you're living in a trailer in the woods kind of right now. I want to tell you too. So my, my girlfriend, like we're living, I live up in Muskoka, Ontario in the fucking middle of nowhere too. And it's beautiful, man. I swear to God, it's why I'm doing so well. It's because I'm in the bush by water in the bush. There's something about being in nature that that's really been helpful to me is that sort of the same i know your brother's big into fishing and that but uh is that sort of been the same story for you or 100 percent, man people lose disconnect i think living in the city and living in the air and being in a box and sitting in front of a computer screen like i just deleted all my social media it sucks like i just had to do it last night felt too plugged in like i just signed out of it everything and i was like you know what i'm done with this for a bit and uh you know it's uh it's one of those things that i like to be in touch with nature i like to go work with my hands i like to train outside and uh that's how i like to live my life and i find uh, that i can find some peace in that and uh and to be healthy right getting sunlight you know uh getting fresh air eating proper uh organic foods not overeating this like you know manufactured garbage that uh you know so many people because it's just another addiction right so when you're in touch with nature it's real it's unforgiving you know if you fall off a cliff you feel it right uh nobody's there to catch you you gotta drag yourself up and you know i do things extreme and i'm a tough person but like for me i think being in nature is the way to go and that's why i live in the trailer out in the middle of the woods man i live eight kilometers into a national park and i wouldn't have it any other way Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, listen, Adam, I'm so glad you're doing well, man. Uh, obviously, with the COVID-19, uh, it's shitty that your fight got postponed. But like you said, it gives you uh, an opportunity to, to you know, touch up your skills a little bit more. Uh, please keep us up to date with when that fight's happening. Um, you know, I'll be, uh, I'll hopefully be there. If I'm not, I'll, I'll be supporting you from afar. Um, if it's just a a live stream i'll be watching it cheering you on man uh anyways uh adam the boogeyman braidwood thank you for joining us uh yeah man it's been a pleasure and i'm looking forward to uh to doing this again sometime definitely my man i'm glad to see you're doing well and uh i wish you all the success with this uh podcast you are going on and like i said when i sign back on i'll pump it up and and uh, do whatever i can to help you okay buddy i'll talk to you soon man thanks again for doing this <laughs> Anytime. You take care. Okay. See you, buddy. Bye, buddy. Bye-bye. Big thanks to the boogeyman, Adam Braidwood, for stopping in and chatting with me on this episode of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. Guys, 
I couldn't do it without your support. It all wouldn't be worth it without your support. Uh, your comments, your direct messages, uh, every time you share my page or subscribe to my page. Guys, I appreciate these things so, so much. Uh, please keep the comments and the feedback coming in. Please subscribe to my channel on YouTube or wherever you may be listening to it. Please share it with your family and friends. Um, guys, keep your eyes peeled on sportsnet.ca on Tuesday morning for Gare Joyce's article on me. Um, it should be interesting. I've seen some of the, the drawings um, that the sketch artist has done for that, and they're just phenomenal, guys. So please check it out. Guys, continue to challenge yourselves, push yourselves, get out of your comfort zone and, you know, be there to help people, be there to give a lending ear because you never know when you might be there to help somebody and you never know how much that, that uh, lending of your ear might uh, help them in whatever situation somebody might be in. It, it could really uh, save their life in some cases, guys, and I'm not even over-exaggerating at all. So, um, guys... Continue listening. If you have any feedback or anything that you think I should hear or anybody that you'd like to see or hear on the podcast, please feel free to, to drop me a line or whatever. DM me, guys. Um, once again, thank you so much for the support. Um, Sportsnet.ca on Tuesday. Team Issued Limited. And thanks again to Adam, the boogeyman Braidwood, for doing this. Uh, guys, I have a big week ahead, uh, not just the Sportsnet article, but on Sunday I have Terry Ryan from Tales with TR stopping in and joining the podcast. Uh, possibly Terry Ryan Sr. If anybody's watched Spittin' Chicklets with Biz Nasty when he went out to Newfoundland with Terry Ryan and Terry Ryan Sr., uh, head over to YouTube. Check that out because it's fucking hilarious. And I'll have Terry Ryan on this Sunday. Uh, and then Sheldon Kennedy stopping by Monday. Uh, I'm so excited to have Sheldon Kennedy on. He's one of my all-time, like most wanted guests on this show, guys. So I'm so excited, so thrilled to have him. Uh, Steve Septel's coming on. I'm going to have Garrett Joyce. Guys, the list, so many great guests. Dale Weiss from the Montreal Canadiens is coming on. Guys, it's just so exciting. Thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait to do it again soon. Take care, guys.